Okay, so today's is another uncut version of our ICU discussions and today's topic of discussion is mainly ischemic strokes. Fortunately, with us today is Dr. Shushan, who is a consultant neurologist with us. And he, when we told him that we are going to discuss stroke uh, today, he was so generous that he spared his time and come for the session so that expert and very crucial points from a neurologist's point of view can be discussed in this. Other than we have Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Chandras and Dr. Abhi also is here. Unfortunately, fortunately, you will not be able to see him for the whole video because he is behind me. And we will be discussing mainly the practical aspects of ischemic strokes. We will not fo uh, focus on the hemorrhagic stroke, but we will give you some idea about uh, how the hemorrhagic stroke present. But topic of discussion is ischemic stroke only. We are going to discuss only the practical aspect, but those are very important things in a clinical practice. So we will start. I will be asking uh, the leading questions so that the flow of the session is maintained and with among us we will discuss like that. If you find this useful, uh, you can take tips from it and if you have any suggestion or doubts, you can post in the comment section. Also, you can go to the ICU.in website and post in the forum sections. So, because we are recording in this uh, uh, ICU environment, it's a live environment. So it can happen you may hear some disturbance from the outside so be here with us okay thank you dr shishan mm -hmm. so first those who are uh, very new means suppose the residents are very new to the icu or intensive care for them just a brief about what is stroke per se what do you mean with what is the terminology which we say that what this patient is having stroke what do we what do you mean by that okay so stroke is defined as an abrupt onset mm. neurological deficit mm. which is attributable to a focal vascular cause. Mm. So in my definition of stroke, I have used two, three words which I briefly describe because the definition of stroke is a clinical one mm. and other laboratory and radiological parameters are just to support the diagnosis but stroke identification is a clinical diagnosis. So, stroke says abrupt onset neurological deficit. That means things which has happened abruptly, acutely within a span of seconds, minutes, hours. Anything which is beyond hours like in days or a week is not considered stroke on clinical backgrounds. Okay. Okay. Second is attributable to a focal vascular event. Stroke are of two types ischemic stroke which is majority chunk that is 85 percent and hemorrhagic stroke that is 15 percent all the stroke have one thing common that they are caused due to some vascular etiology either hemorrhage increased blood flow rupture of blood vessels or due to a clot which we called as an ischemic or an infarction stroke so stroke is an abrupt onset focal deficit due to a focal vascular cause okay so uh so we'll start like suppose in the ICU or uh, in the emergency, a patient comes to us, and patient comes to us with an abrupt onset of symptoms uh, like uh, there is a slurring or there is a hemiplegia, hemiparesis like that. So is there any something clinical things by which we can differentiate whether this could be hemorrhagic or this could be ischemic? Before ischemic hemorrhagic, let's see whether it is a stroke or a stroke mimic. mimic huh? Okay, so what what all things you need to identify which can mimic like stroke? So one thing I think hypoglycemia is something which ev everyone the most common uh, means the first investigation. If I would say why uh, uh, one should measure is the blood sugar level because hypoglycemia is the most common mimic for stroke. Okay. Uh, yes. So any patient coming with loss of awareness, any focal deficit, first thing to measure is okay. the blood sugars because hypoglycemia is the most common cause mm. in our country, even worldwide, first cause of uh, neurological deficit. Okay. Second stroke mimic is seizure. Okay, yes. Seizure can present with this. Seizure can present. Patient might have had a seizure in sleep, in awake state, and then he can have the residual weakness, which we call as Todd's palsy. Achha. Due to. Okay. Third differential is migraine. Sometimes even migrainous headache can lead to hemiparesis, which we call as uh, hemiplegic migraines. So these are two, three short uh, stroke mimics that we need to keep in mind before starting our line of management okay so this uh, press and uh, uh, one more thing was there um, 
venous sinus thrombosis can also present like stroke venous sinus thrombosis we'll discuss in hemorrhagic stroke okay. venous sinus thrombosis is also no, no. because of the vascular changes no. but the etiology is different the management is different presentation may or may not be of that of a stroke hypertensive encephalopathy means hypertensive emergency can also present with that the patient is having very high blood pressure and can present with some history of uh, numbness tingling sort of yes encephalopathy is alteration in the brain parenchyma mm. which can be due to hypertension can be due to any metabolic causes mm. anything but in this the acute causes hypertensive emergencies press syndrome mm. uh aur aapne aur kya bola sinus sinus thrombosis these can present these are some stroke mimics basically. okay so the Uh, from a junior resident level point of view any person who is presented into your emergency or intensive care and having symptoms of acute onset focal neurological deficit it could be subtle things like uh, it could be slurring of the speech there is it could be hemiparesis there could be difficulty in speech or i think at times you can have patient presented with a sudden loss of vision sort of things so Until unless proven otherwise, if you don't have an hypoglycemia in your records, consider that is a stroke because don't uh, try to differentiate uh, uh, differentiate all the mimics right from the beginning. It's an ongoing process which you should continue. Otherwise, we'll lose the crucial time if the patient is actually having stroke. So first, there are few things I would like to uh, say. Now, once a stroke-like patient comes to emergency. within 10 minutes it should be seen by a physician what is written in the uh, books we have uh, our notes and uh, uh, records also here so that we don't miss important points so it is written door to physician physician time should be less than 10 minutes door to stroke team for us dr shushant or any other neurologist or the radio uh, neurologist who can intervene uh, for thrombolysis of the stroke uh, is our stroke team so they should be notified within 15 minutes door to ct initiation CT initiation should be done within 25 minutes, and uh, CT interpretation should be done within 45 minutes. These are the maximum values, but I think it should be done well before that because 45 minutes is a very large time. But as soon as you receive a patient of stroke, get a stroke team involved. Call to the neurologist. Call to the radiology department. Emergency CT scan plain brain should be done, and. Um, then we'll discuss that whether we need to thrombolyze or not to thrombolyze but it should be done within 60 minutes so we have a patient suppose we are uh, discussing a hypothetical scenario we have a uh, patient who come with a stroke like uh, uh, picture and we uh, now next thing is we have taken the vitals we recorded the vitals sugars are normal and we are very much sure that this patient is having stroke and we get a ct brain plain done now there is some confusion for many residents that the ct brain is normal so what does this signify can, can anyone tell me if the ct brain is normal that means the patient is having stroke or not having any stroke can i ask you so this patient is having stroke but it's not of hemorrhagic type yes. ha ah, basically the purpose of doing ct scan immediately is to rule out hemorrhagic bleed because if it, nothing is there on the ct scan that this patient is developing ischemic stroke and the infarct has not developed so that there is a no changes on the ct scan and this can, patient is a potential candidate for thrombolysis thrombolysis now uh, what is the window period means from the onset how much is the window period up to which time we can thrombolyze the patient we, the treatment Actually, of these symptoms are fast or okay so uh, important thing what are the clinical symptoms a patient can present with a stroke ha uh-huh. so as we say in stroke time is brain uh-huh. and we have to act fast uh-huh. so by fast we means four things that we need to see in a stroke patient one is phase deviation a person with a stroke will have a deviation to either a right or a left side depend on the site of his stroke second is arm weakness uh-huh. the patient with stroke may present with uh, unilateral or bilateral arm or leg weakness depend upon the again the site size and the etiology of the stroke mm. second difficult differences in speech that is s mm. the patient with stroke will have slight slurring which we called as dysarthria or he may again according to the location of the stroke will have aphasia sensory or motor mm. that we will see mm. but speech we need to remember 
एंड सेकेंड इज अगेन टाइम टाइम ऑफ ऑनसेट ऑफ स्ट्रोक इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज ऑल आर लाइन ऑफ मैनेजमेंट इज डिसाइडेड बाय द टाइम द पेशेंट वॉज लास्ट सीन नॉर्मल और द टाइम वेन द स्ट्रोक हैज अकर्ड सो दिस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टर्म सर है fast and secondly you uh, sir has said when was the patient last seen normal this is very very important because this will actually tell you from how much duration the patient is developing symptom why it is important because thrombolysis is indicated when the patient is in the window period so uh, sir can you tell me uh, what do you mean by this last seen normal because we can have a scenario when the patient is uh, was doing his activities normally in the day time and then developed suddenly some symptoms it can happen that patient uh, wake up with such symptoms hmm. so this last seen normal how it comes into play in such scenario so i tell you see in certain situations like suppose when we are with patient and the stroke has occurred in front of us like a uh, patient relatives has seen patient developing deviation of face or arm weakness and so in that scenario we can tell the exact time ki the stroke has happened suppose half an hour or one hour or maybe two or three hours before hmm. but what in cases when the patient in the morning when woke up was found to have weakness in one side or was found to have deviation of face in such scenarios where there is difficult to ensure the exact time of stroke that when the stroke would have happened it may have happened at 12 pm it may happen at midnight it may have happened just before <clears throat> he awakened so in that case scenario we say the time the patient was last seen normal that is just before going to bed or last when patient was fine full conscious without any neurological deficit that time is known as the time the patient was last seen normal uh, because i remember one scenario in which the patient wake, woke up with stroke patient wake up with stroke but uh, other than the uh, attendant which saw the patient last seen normal was in the bed he was going to bed around 11 pm but in at 3 am the patient woke up and went to the bathroom and then again came and uh, slept so in this case the last seen normal will be 3 am in the morning like that why it is important we'll come to that the importance is when a clot uh, is uh, forming in a vessel in, uh, in in the brain the early in the early clot is a little bit soft and it we can thrombolyze this patient you can have call so i think huh? okay so uh, why we are saying that this last seen normal is important because the lesser the time you pick the stroke in the early stage the stroke uh, clot is fragile the embolus is fragile and we can thrombolyze this patient on time and the significant comorbidities can be prevented if the thrombus has taken and solidified with over a period of time it's very difficult to thrombolyze those patients and then the chances of interventions uh, get limited so now after having discussion identifying the stroke picking the sign and symptom and we have done a ct scan brain plane to rule out that there is no bleed in this patient absolutely we know that this is a potential candidate for stroke thrombolysis now before jumping on to the options available for thrombolysis iv versus mechanical what are the window periods sir in which we can thrombolyze whether it's 3 hours 4.5 hours 6 hours 12 hours 24 hours what is the actual uh, window period in which the stroke can be thrombolyzed fine so the window period in which the stroke a patient coming to stroke can be thrombolyzed is 4.5 hours since the onset of stroke ha uh, onset of symptom since the onset of symptom 4.5 hours is that golden time in which if we thrombolyze the patient we can provide a maximal benefits mm-hmm. without causing any hemorrhagic complications to the okay. patient because if you thrombolyze after this period iv thrombolysis then the chances of reperfusion are less and the chances of bleeding catastrophic bleeding increases so other than 4.45 hours are there certain other options also available by which we can intervene a little bit okay so guideline right now says ki only 4.5 hours mm. but then there are certain things which we see on mr imaging films and we can perceive that the stroke is of onset less than 4.5 hours mm. for example if we do an mri two types of imaging dwi that is diffusion weighted imaging and flare imaging mm. flu and if mm. flare imaging mm. imaging in that if we see the difference between the dwi in a flare image mm. 
that if the stroke has occurred on DWI image, but stroke is not there on the flare image, we perceive that the onset of symptom is less than 4.5 hours because it takes around 4.5, 4 to 4.5 hours for a ischemic changes to appear on a flare image. Whereas in diffusion image, we can see stroke as early as 30 minutes. So if the infarct is seen on a diffusion image, but not on a flare image, we say that the stroke is less than 4.5 hours. But then again, this is not very accurate. Very, This is a trial which is on an ECAS trial, ECAS 1 and ECAS 2 trial, which says on this. And on the basis of this, sometimes we do thrombolize the patient if there is diffusion and flare mismatch or we do a CT perfusion study that if the patient has an infarct on diffusion but then still there is a viable tissue a large number of penumbra where the neurons are stable but not dead hibernated but not in necros we can provide benefit of thrombolysis during that 4.5 hour to that penumbra region so either DWI flare mismatch or perfusion DWI mismatch ratio we calculate and then we thrombolize okay so what we have discussed, I am summing up in uh, one minute regarding the imaging. First imaging, types of imaging, you have CT brain plane in which you are practically ruling out your uh, whether the patient is having hemorrhagic stroke or not. So if CT is normal, that's fine. You have onset of symptom, well, uh, means cutoff is clear with your attendant has seen in the morning that patient was a normal and now it started developing symptom. You have window period within three hours, then CT brain uh, plane or 4.5 hours. CT brain plane is the image modality of choice in which there is no infarct dilation. But like if a patient woke up with stroke on the last day, normal is not known and you'd want to know whether we can thrombolize or not thrombolize. So we have, you have two imaging techniques available. One is MRI. Don't go for a full MRI imaging. Only two cuts are required. One is diffusion and another is flare. So if they on diffusion, the hyper intensity has developed, but on the flare imaging, there are no signs. That means diffusion can come within 30 minutes, but for flare, it takes 4.5 times, 4.5 fires to develop so if there is on the diffusion not on the flare you can have a window if this patient is in the window period you can thrombolize third imaging is ct perfusion scan in this you can identify the core which is the uh, main point where the damage has started and there is a uh, penumbra means penumbra is uh, the portion which is supplied by the core and also from the collateral so that part of the brain which can be reperfused timely can be salvageable so on that perfusion imaging your core size should be less than 25 cc penumbra should be 1.8 times of the core and your nih scale should be more than 10 means the there should be no no I mean the infarct should not be bigger very big the core size telling that it should be less than 25 cc penumbra should be 1.8 times of the core means there should be significant penumbra uh, that which you which you can salvage by thrombolysis and third, there is significant comorbid, significant morbidity this stroke has uh, caused, that is NIHS scale uh, more than 10. So these are the imaging techniques by, by which you can uh, come to the conclusion whether we can thrombolize or not. Now, because we have discussed NIHS scale, all of you should know that NIHS scale is National Institute of Health score scale, which is uh, the commonest scale uh, to use the severity of stroke, whether minor stroke, moderate stroke or severe stroke. Thrombolysis is helpful only in moderate and severe category. No, no, then also it is very subjective. Okay. In some patients, NIHS score of 1 is not significant. But if it is affecting his occupation, I will give you a small example because I am a cricket fan. Huh. For example, if an umpire hmm. has a weakness in right finger, hmm. he will not able to raise this. So this will cause his loss of occupation. Hmm. This will cause him, he will not be able to give a decision. So in such patients, in such scenarios, mm -hmm. we take it on a case-to-case -case basis. Case, yeah. Although guideline says that thrombolysis is not very beneficial in patients with severe NIHS score, NIHS score of more than 25, in that uh, the patient might have uh, loss more than benefit. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in patients in recovering stroke or in NIHS 1 or 2 score, mm -hmm. sometimes the stroke is on the path of recovering. So by giving thrombolysis, we might not be able to help him more. Okay. okay. So we have to uh, uh, we have to weigh the risk versus benefit ratio in thrombolizing patient based on NIHS score, obviously. Okay. So uh, now 
one more technique which is not straight away in the guidelines but other than thrombolysis you have mechanical thrombectomy which we can go through guide wire and pull out the uh, clot and do suction also this technique for this technique also you need to give iv thrombolysis we can give iv thrombolysis initially mm -hmm. and after that we can uh, even mechanically thrombectomy we can remove the clot this is this is not very much done in many center but many trials which are done for this is usually of the anterior circulation for middle circul uh, circulation they are not much but for basilar i mean posterior circulation though the trials are not available there are some trials like basics and best in which uh, uh, thrombolysis is not indicated even thrombectomy is not, they didn't come in favor of thromb thrombectomy by a mechanical uh, instrument but as sir said the posterior circulation stroke causes significant comorbidities patient can be ve vegetative when patient can be um, lifelong on the bed so some centers uh, uh, across the world do mechanical thrombectomy especially for the posterior circulation stroke, like basilar top syndrome something like that so now we we our patient we have identified this patient is having stroke we done a ct scan we did a wake, in wake up stroke we asked last normal we have done a ct perfusion or diffusion flare mismatch and now we have come to the conclusion that uh, we will thrombolyze this patient now before taking this decision what are the contraindications in which even if your patient is a potential candidate for thrombolysis what are the condition in which you will not thrombolyze mm. so exclusion criteria you should uh, remember so certain exclusion criteria uh, i am reading out yes. if, if uh, some uh, discrepancy you can tell. so patient history if there is a on history basis if there is a history of head trauma or history of ischemic stroke in the past three months if any in the lifetime the patient has in intracranial hemorrhage so this patient can bleed why we are taking this exclusion because if we thrombolize this patient very high chances are there that the patient will bleed and having catastrophic intracranial bleed or at some other location if the patient is having intraaxial neuroplasm these patients bleed too much or if the patient has intracranial intraspinal surgery within three months three months now like this on patient history if they ask for the gi malignancy if the patient has gi malignancy or the or patient GI bleed. or gi bleed in the last 21 days okay now uh, on clinical grounds one is if there are signs and symptoms suggestive of subarachnoid hemorrhage i won't go with this because i already have done a ct scan in which you have ruled out persistent elevation of blood pressure we'll come to this when we'll uh, talk with uh, uh, discuss about thrombolysis active internal bleeding history if it is there if the presentation is consistent with infective endocarditis cardioembolic stroke are common but suppose this patient is a case of infective endocarditis and now has developed stroke even in your institute this is a contraindication for thrombolysis and stroke suspected to be associated with aortic heart dissection means the aortic heart dissected and it has gone upwards uh, carotid dissection obviously in aortic dissection you cannot thrombolyze or if uh, the patient has a bleeding tendency some disorder hematologic platelet count less than one lakh if the patient is on anticoagulant some cirrhotic patient or some other patient come inr value more than 1.7 PT more than 15 seconds or APTT more than 40 uh, seconds. These are contraindications, but the catch is mm, uh, although it uh, will uh, discuss that not all the tests are required and that they need to be waited for the result to come. Huh. Actually, regarding thrombolysis, I think thrombolysis itself is a very big topic and we'll have a detailed presentation about uh, thrombolysis maybe in our next or next. Huh. We just will finish up in the next uh, 10 minutes regarding uh, stroke. Uh, uh, stroke you know? And then um, uh, evidence of hemorrhage or this. So now we have decided that we'll thrombolyze this patient. So what are the vital parameters which we need to see, which needs to be maintained? So if you, especially regarding the blood pressure. So if we are thrombolizing the patient, uh, then your systolic blood pressure should be less than 185 and diastolic less than 110 and it should be maintained for uh, next 24 hours. If the patient is, we are not thrombolizing, then your blood pressure should be less than 220 and diastolic. Uh, uh, systo systolic so, 220 by 120 220 by uh, diastole and it should be this should not be uh, drop down uh, very fast because it can uh, lead to uh, infarct also until unless you have signs of failure or hypertensive failure sort of thing 
So now we thrombolyze usually by recombinant tissue plasma activity. So the dose of this is 0.9 milligram per kg. And ten uh, percent uh, bolus has to be given uh, a stat, followed by rest in the duration of remaining one hour. One hour, and then once you have thrombolyzed, uh, you need to monitor the vitals of the patient every five ten minutes on the blood pressure and any focal deficit. Patient, whether patient is improving or deteriorating, if there is a sudden deterioration, get a CT scan urgently so that to rule out bleed. But there is one question which everybody wants to ask that. Always when we thrombolyze the patient, will it improve the outcome whether the patient will recover a deficit or not? So I think what the trials have said that in patients who have used RTPA and in patients on which you don't have used thrombolysis, after 90 days the recovery of the patient in which even though they didn't recover initially but their recovery was uh, a lot better post 30, yes. uh, post 90 days. <laughs> yes. So. Uh, for that trial, they have used MRS scale, modified ranking so scale which has 0 to 5. So they found out that 90 days after the thrombolysis, the patients who have been thrombolyzed were more independent, were more ambulatory as compared to the patients who were not. So, okay. So, one thing. So when you have now you have decided that you will thrombolyze this patient. So antiplatelet should be given at that time. Heparin should be given at that time or not? If we need to thrombolyze, if we need to thrombolyze this patient, whether we will give or not. So no antiplatelet and no anticoagulant for next 24 okay. hours should be given till the when the patient has been thrombolyzed. Now suppose this patient is not in the window period, and. Uh, we have decided that we are not going to thrombolyze or we could not thrombolyze this patient. So, how will you start the management? What what drugs you will give? Whether you give aspirin, whether you give dual antiplatelet or whether you will start with a nobulocular weight heparin. We should start with aspirin. aspirin. So, uh, there is something interesting which earlier only single anticoagulant uh, antiplatelet uh, along with good hydration uh, was there which needs to be given but now certain uh, guidelines say that dual antiplatelet in certain scenarios should be given for 21 days and then switch over to single one yeah. uh, can uh, anybody high tell what are those uh, criteria high risk tia or mild infarct mild ischemic infarct mild ischemic infarct so mild nih is uh, less than 3 less than 5 i think 5, five. Le so if nih scale is less than 5 and or if it's a high TIA transient ischemic attack, then you should cont continue with dual antiplatelet for 21 days. 21 days and switch over to single, uh, single antiplatelet. Is low molecular weight also recommended in ischemic stroke as a therapy for this uh, vascular event or it's only for DVT prophylaxis? Low molecular weight heparin or I say any anticoagulant is generally not used now according to the latest American ASI guidelines of stroke for ischemic stroke. Uh -huh. It is basically required in case of an embolic stroke. Okay. If we have a cardioembolic stroke or any embolic stroke, uh -huh. then we can give anticoagulants which may <coughs> range from heparin to warfarin depends on the patient's uh, uh -huh. criteria. But for ischemic stroke, hmm. low molecular weight heparin is not given. Okay. LMWS or low molecular weight heparin and fractionate heparin can be given as prophylaxis of DVT. DVT, DVT. Now, so we have thromb we have two wings. One, we have thrombolyzed the patient. Other, we don't have thrombolyzed. We have maintained the blood pressure target. We have maintained the blood pressure target in both the categories. In other patients' special condition, we have started dual antiplatelet with low molecular weight. Is there any role of anticonvulsants per se for giving in acute ischemic stroke? Yes, if a stroke is large and we are suspecting, if, if it is surrounded by cerebral edema, mm -hmm. then we should give antiplatelets. No, no, antiepileptics. Antiepileptics. no, I don't think there is any preventive or any precautionary or preemptive use of antiepileptics in, in the, the guidelines. So only if the patient, uh, if the patient uh, uh, has developed seizure, or any then evidence, only we any evidence on the EEG, so um, uh, then only you start uh, anticonvulsant. Okay, if we need to start low molecular weight also, heparin also, then only it should be started after 24 hours. Suppose we are th after thrombolysis, after thrombolysis, 24 hours. But if we are not thrombolyzing the patient, then 
if we have not thrombolyzed the patient and we require DVT profile, like the patient is totally non-ambulatory and there is lack of uh, uh, physiotherapy or awareness, but then only we need to start low molecular weight parent. Otherwise, what I prefer is I prefer foot massage by the relatives as well as the attendant as well as DVT. DVT, DVT, DVT compression devices. Now, suppose if the patient uh, bleeds after thrombolysis, so obviously you need to get an immediate CT scan, sudden deterioration in the GCS, then call a neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon should always be called when you are planning to thrombolyze the patient so that he can or she can have a look on the patient per se, have a detailed history that within 24-40 hours he can get an emergency call. Uh, then uh, obviously you need to reverse the thrombolysis by uh, plasma products, FFP and the, um, uh, whatever is required and then depending upon the type of surgery you can uh, uh, do the surgery mm. obviously good uh, good amount of neuro uh, monitoring is required in the ICU like GCS pupils vitals in the vitals if you are seeing a shoot up in the blood pressure and bradycardia this is a sign that the patient may developing raised ICP it's an early sign of bleed now we we have discussed the acute management of the stroke Certain before ending, there are certain important points for the secondary prevention of second prevention of secondary insult. One of them is hyperglycemia. Patient should be prevented from hyperglycemia. Sugar should be ma maintained. In ICU, actually, there is a liberal control of the sugar, which we say is 180 to 200 or somewhere between 140 to 180. But in neuro patient, in stroke patient, try to maintain the sugar levels less than 140. Second is pyrexia. Fever. It could be due to central origin, it could be due to any infection cause, it could be due to any inflammation. But you need to aggressively treat fever in stroke patient because if uh, uh, there is a fever, there is an increased metabolic demand of the brain and it can cause a secondary insult. So, pyrexia should be treated ag aggressively. Hyper? Uh, hyper? Avoid Hypercapnia, huh, that means airway breathing circulation should be always taken care of. If um, uh, um, uh, if the patient suppose on ventilator for any X, Y, Z reason you took the patient on ventilator, then usually it is taken in hemorrhagic stroke. But in ischemic stroke, if, you, if at all you want to take this patient on ventilator, always try to maintain the PCO2 level somewhere around 32 to 35. Because if you have more PCO2, then it will cause venodilatation brain. It will cause raised ICP. If the PCO2 is too low, 25, 20 or 22, then it can cause vasoconstriction and it can increase the infarct size. Regarding the pupillary monitoring, one thing is important in the posterior circulation stroke because it is in the lower side uh, below the tent, uh, below the that uh, tentorium. tentorium. So pupillary dilatation will be a later sign in such cases. So pupillary dilatation will come a later sign. So for such patients, always, always, always keep a watch on the GCS. In hemodynamics, if the GCS is uh, decreasing, uh, the, if a one or two uh, drop in the GCS should prompt you to get an immediate CT scan done. Then we have discussed anticoagulation, antiplatelet, thromboprophylaxis. Okay, another common thing which uh, we have managed intracranial hypertension also. Anything anybody wants to um, um, uh, any any common mistakes which should be avoided uh, in, in stroke patients? It's the role of anti edema measures. Ah, yes, very important. Anti means mannitol or three percent saline. Should they be routinely used in? Uh, there is no routine. There should not be any routine use of these mm. osmotic diuretic agents. In fact, uh -huh. in fact, diuretics can worsen the stroke and can decrease the perfusion. So you need to hydrate such patients initially. Is of ischemic stroke, you need to start if the cardiac status is good. You start fluids on 100 ml, 80 to 100 ml per hour at least for 24 hours, like that. The other thing is how much BP should uh, be decreased. Like uh, mm -hmm. first, we say that uh, it uh, 24 hours it should be decreased by 15 percent. Is it right? So. BP should only be decreased in case of ischemic stroke if the BP is more than 220 by 120. If the BP systolic blood pressure of the patient is less than 220 by 120 in case we are not thrombolizing then there is no need to decrease the blood pressure. Sure. If we decrease the blood pressure in first 24 hours decrement should not be more than 15 to 20 percent and then gradually we need to maintain the BP 
up to 140 by 90. Over a period of days. And if we are thrombolizing, then obviously 185 by 110 is the for for next 24 hours. Any other mistakes, Dr. Chandra? Yeah, uh, people. Why do uh, BP should be uh, maintained by long acting drugs or short acting drugs? Like means what are the anti uh, hypertensives of choice in stroke or uh, so different people can have different choices in stroke. What I prefer is to maintain a baseline blood pressure rather than the highs and lows or the crests and troughs in the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So I prefer the retard preparation of mm -hmm. calcium channel blockers, mm -hmm. be it uh, dipine retard or. Uh, Nicardia retard or, or along with an ACE ARBs because ACE ARBs they have some cardioprotective, some angioprotective properties also. Mm. So I usually start with an ACE or an ARB and if required, a calcium channel blocker and retard preparation is can be. Had. Usually, management of blood pressure comes handy uh, comes in uh, vascular events where there is a hemorrhage. Uh, so in hemorrhagic strokes, you need to the drug of choice is labetalol. Uh, because we don't want to use any other drug because uh, another, beta, another beta blocker will decrease the heart rate and we will not be able to monitor whether this is due to raised ICP or due to drugs. So Labetalol is something which is the drug of choice for decreasing uh, blood pressure in uh, hemorrhagic stroke. But I had rightly said in ischemic stroke you can be a VARBs for that and then you can add secondary calcium channel blockers. Avoid using diuretics uh, in such patient because it can dehydrate the patients. Also this is severe dehydration is one of the causes of leading to acute uh, stroke. Statin should be added uh, right away or they can be uh, weighted means in, in ischemic stroke statins. There is no clear cut guidelines on this but, and there is no clear role of statins. Also, uh, but usually we start with low dose of statins, to, maybe 10 to 20 because, milligram because not of the decreased cholesterol because of the rheologic properties the statins have. Okay. So statins in stroke acutely are not used to decrease the cholesterol or triglyceride levels but they are used for the rheologic properties because they have some capability they act on blood vessels also mm -hmm. because on those properties the statins should be added in low dose. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Any other thing? Uh, any other thing uh, which we need, which you are missing or which is commonly in the problem which you face in managing, managing stroke? The stroke management is a holistic approach. Uh -huh. It requires a team uh -huh. rather than an individual effort. Uh -huh. What we have here is a stroke unit comprising of emergency doctors, nurses, intervention, neurointerventionist, intensivist hmm. and neurologist and a good radiologist. So okay. Together, we will and we can. Okay. So, this was in short about uh, stroke but in summing up in 2-3 minutes, the what are the focus areas is one, when the patient comes to you, first identify whether this patient is having stroke or not, if it is a stroke whether it, uh, it is not due to hypoglycemia. Once that has been ruled out, you go uh, with the imaging. Also with the history, you start uh, yeah. looking for the stroke mimics. Activate your radiology team, uh, activate your neurology team, then get a CT brain done. Then identify whether this patient is in the window period or not window period. If you were not, if last seen normal was witnessed, that is fine enough. If it is not witnessed, then you can go for either MR uh, diffusion and flare. Discrepancy between MRI brain diffusion of flare can give you an idea whether within 4.5 hours. If not, if you have CT perfusion imaging, then it, with the core size, the penumbra, and the NIH scale. Once you have identified that we can thrombolize this patient, check out the do your checklist that whether there is a contraindication to thrombolysis. If there is no contraindication to thrombolysis, then look for the vitals, maintain the blood pressure in the set target for the next 24 hours if you are thrombolizing. If not, then there is a different thing. Once you have decided you are going to thrombolize this patient, go with the thrombolysis, monitor the patient, alert to the neurosurgeon that this patient may or may not require surgery in the next 24 hours. Then once you have thrombolized the patient, uh, or uh, still you feel that this is a high large vessel occlusion stroke uh, then you can also take help of um, intervention radio, uh, neurologists they can do a mechanical thrombosuction in this is helpful in large vessel occlusion if it is especially of the posterior circulation because this gives a uh, very uh, 
large amount of morbidity to the patient also nih scale uh, scale though it is a good uh, um, uh, scale to predict that this will get uh, uh, this patient should be thrombolyzed or not but as sir uh, dr shishant already told the amount of morbidity for that particular patient occupational morbidity should be taken into consideration while deciding these factors once you have thrombolyzed any deterioration in the gci should prompt you to do get immediate ct scan done and then call for surgery if it is there hemorrhage if if it is all going well then you to maintain good sugar levels good hydration go good amount of uh, uh, blood pressure no role of anti convulsion or anti edema measure initially good dvt prophylaxis and then secondary care physiotherapy and all so this was in short about and some of the mistake dr chandras has picked up in the starting that um, uh, which the residents uh, do mistake uh, in their treating part so if you have any doubt regarding stroke or if you have any good point regarding stroke which we have missed you can ask in the comment section or you can go to icu.in in the forums you can ask and um, dr shushant is with us in apollo indore and he is a very dynamic neurologist thank you dr shushant thank for you, your sir. sparing time with us and dr garima has also joined with us she is not in the frame and thank you to all the students and residents fellows who are uh, who have done their shift but they are uh, just here for uh, making this lecture and discussing this lecture thank you uh, very much and still i would say do read more about it thank you